Sociolinguistics is one of my favorite fields in linguistics. Sociolinguists focus on things like social norms, language varieties, group memberships, and language attitudes. So stick around and let's take a look at sociolinguistics. Hi, welcome to Snap Language. I'm Mark Franco. Sociolinguistics is a broad subfield in linguistics. So I'll go into some of its main areas of interest. I'll go into other details in future videos. Think of a natural language you don't know anything about. It could be any language. How would you get to know it? You might start with some vocabulary. As soon as you start learning some basic words and expressions, you notice it has different sounds. You also start noticing how sentences are put together. As you're learning things about it, let's say you find out it has several words for you. Huh. And it uses these different forms of you in very specific social situations. You also realize you use different grammar depending on Again, who you're talking to and what the social situation is. Well, now you've entered the realm of sociolinguistics. Sociolinguistics is the study of how social norms and the social context affect language use. In English, we have only one word for you, so initially having multiple ways to say you may not make much sense. But when you get into the social aspect of a language that has for example, a formal and an informal you, you realize that the distinction plays an important role for the speakers of that language. It's an important social role. If you think about it, although in English we use you to address people in any situation, we still change the way we address them in different social contexts. Where would you put these along a continuum of formality? Probably like this. Hey, How's it going? Hello, how are you? Good morning, sir. How are you doing today? So, English does reflect social norms for formality, it's just not in the pronoun. Some people may judge the social norms of a culture based on a superficial linguistic feature, so to speakers of a language that has formal and informal forms of view, English may sound too direct or even rude. But a social linguist would analyze a number of possible features in the language that reveals how social norms drive language use. Let's look at another example in English. We have only one imperative form of the verb, as in, come with me. Direct commands are not always socially appropriate, so we might add please to add a level of politeness. But it still sounds a bit direct, so how about adding a question tag? Come with me, will you please? Come with me, would you please? Huh, that makes the command sound friendlier and friendlier, doesn't it? But the verb is still in the imperative form. What if we got rid of it altogether? Will you please come with me? Or would you please come with me? Oh, that's even more polite. We could go a step further. Would you mind coming with me, please? We could even say, sorry to bother you, sir. Would you mind coming with me, please? An important point to take away from this is that social linguistics studies how language reflects social norms. Different languages may have different mechanisms to follow social norms and, for example, mark levels of formality. You can use different pronouns or words, in some languages, you use particles whose sole function is to add new ones to the statement. You may achieve the same effect using syntax. And social norms are not just about levels of formality. I've used this just as an example. Social norms can regulate how people take turns in a conversation, how we show interest in the speaker, how people of different social status talk to each other, and so forth. So, knowing the grammar of a language isn't always enough to be able to use the language appropriately. Languages are used in social and cultural contexts that have specific social norms. Unless you're aware of these social norms and how the language is used to reflect them, the grammar alone isn't enough to use the language effectively. 
in its social context, that is. And that's why there are all these anecdotes about people learning a new language, producing a perfectly well-built sentence, and causing some colossal social blunder. Another interesting area within social linguistics has to do with language variation in distinct social groups. In the United States, for example, you can tell what part of the country someone is from based on the language variety they speak. Sometimes an accent tells you if someone is from the north or the south. Sometimes it tells you even what city that person's from. And it's not just the phonology. You can find variation in all aspects of the language. For example, in some parts of the United States, you may hear something like, I might could go tomorrow. In standard American English, this is considered grammatically incorrect, but for the speakers of some regional dialects, it's perfectly fine. It conveys meaning in a way that's shared by that linguistic community. Telling the young doctor what he'd done well and what he might could have done differently. Another example is what people call a soft drink, depending where you are in the country. Some people call it soda, others pop. Or whether you say dinner or supper, faucet or spigot, bubbler or water fountain. So how's this interesting for a social linguist? Language varieties are not just a curiosity. Accents and regionalisms are also used as markers of social group memberships. Even within the same geographical area, you'll find language variation that signals what specific groups people belong to. So these are groups within a group. Even in the same area, you may find language variation depending on the speaker's age, gender, social status, and so forth. An example everyone can relate to has to do with distinct language varieties in different age groups. The younger generation tends to create changes in the language, innovations in vocabulary and language use. Because reasons. You end up with a language variety that's distinctive of that generation. Some innovations by millennials, for example, include salty, woke, thirsty, clap back, cancel, lit, adulting, and yes. If you don't know exactly what these mean, you're probably not a millennial. Other generations may end up adopting some of these innovations. So if you're woke, you get it. But often, the older generation judges the younger generation's language use as corrupting the language. They're butchering the language. They're killing the art of conversation. They can't even write anymore. If you think like that, well, you're probably not a social linguist. But maybe I'm just too old to appreciate it, you know. And you should also remember that your generation was probably accused of the same thing. And today's generation will probably say the same things about the generation after them. For example, in the 1300s, a Japanese monk wrote this about what was going on at the time. In all things, I yearn for the past. Modern fashions seem to keep on growing more and more debased. And as for writing letters, surviving scraps from the past reveal how superb the phrasing used to be. The ordinary spoken language has also steadily coarsened a deplorable corruption. Dude, that's harsh. For a linguist, language change is just a natural process. For a social linguist, these differences in language use simply help us understand how they're used to identify group memberships. And many linguistic features can mark group membership. As I mentioned before, phonological differences are perceived as accents that identify certain groups. Differences in vocabulary grammatical constructions, and even supersegmental features such as voice quality and intonation, like this whole vocal fry and up speak situation. Human beings are social animals. It's important to be part of a group, and it's important for the group to be able to identify other members. Our appearance can signal group membership. We also feel we're part of a community if we behave more like its members, 
And of course, language variation is a strong signal of group membership. In turn, that creates another phenomenon social linguists are interested in, language attitudes. Because the language variety people use is associated with group membership, it's also a social cue used to judge them. In very simple terms, we have in-groups and out-groups. And, as you'd expect, we favor the behaviors and the language variety of our in-group. If someone uses a language variety that's distinct from ours, we quickly put them in the out-group category. And, just as quickly, the language attitude associated with this perceived group membership triggers stereotypical perceptions. In the United States, the language variety that's considered the standard American English is associated with generally positive or neutral attributes. Speakers of so-called Southern dialects are often associated with less than positive attributes, such as uneducated. Female speakers using some vocal qualities and intonation, like the California Valley Girl, are associated with being clueless or superficial. Sometimes the stereotype associated with a New York accent is rough and rude. But wait a minute. Sometimes people perceive a Southern accent as sexy and a New York accent as outgoing and approachable. There's something social linguists call language prestige and non-prestige. Non-prestige dialects are said to trigger negative stereotypes and the opposite is true with prestige dialects, but that's a bit simplistic. Stereotypes are not always negative and the same language variety can trigger both positive and negative stereotypes. For example, speakers with a southern accent can be perceived as friendly and charming. Someone with a British accent can be perceived as educated and elegant and at the same time, stuck up or arrogant. And obviously, non-native accents are not immune to these stereotyped perceptions. In the United States, a French accented speaker can sometimes be perceived as sophisticated and sometimes as arrogant. A Spanish accented speaker as friendly and as low status. A German accented speaker as someone who strives for perfection and as overly strict or stern. Of course, these are all based on stereotypical group attitudes. The same language variety, or a language for that matter, can be considered prestige or non-prestige by different social groups. This means there's nothing intrinsically good or bad about a language variety or the people who use it. Stereotypical perceptions can be powerful and difficult to shake they're triggered very quickly and we're usually unaware of them at a conscious level. Even when you point them out, people often resist changing them and sadly they end up acting on these perceptions, even when they know they're not grounded on reality. <sighs> I can hear the comments. Yeah, but all stereotypes are based on something for reals. Dude, this is a video about social linguistics, not about justifying your isms. This, what can we do? There's nothing to do. In social linguistics, understanding the mechanisms involved in language attitudes is a fascinating and very complex field of study. In a future video, I'll go into some of these mechanisms in a little more detail. Social linguistics sometimes intersects other fields of study. It relies on subfields of linguistics to make sense of the role of society on language use. Pragmatics, for example, is the study of how context influences meaning, so it's very useful for social linguists. You can draw on social psychology to understand stereotypical attitudes. And sociology of language is the other side of the coin. It contributes to an understanding of the impact of language on society. I'm planning on a series of videos related to social linguistics, but you see, it wouldn't make sense to make new videos on a topic unless there's a positive response from viewers. So if you enjoy this video, please give it a like and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button so you know when we post new Snap Language videos. And until the next time, thanks for stopping by and watching this video.
millennials talk funny. <laughs> no, they don't.